Now, I warned you up front that we're going to be talking about stewardship in October, just as we talked about call in September. And everybody hears stewardship and they think money, 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 money. So here's your stewardship joke of the day. Two men were on a yacht sailing across the Pacific Ocean. It was a big ship. A storm came up at sea, washed the entire crew off, and these two men were left alone, and the boat went so far off course they had no idea where they were, and suddenly it crashed, and they washed up on the shore of a tiny island. Now, one of the men was pacing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, saying, we're lost, we're doomed. They won't even know where to begin to look for us. The other man said, oh, relax, they're going to find us any minute. His friend said to him, how can you know that? We are so far off course, they wouldn't even begin to know how to look. The other man said, oh, there's nothing to worry about. We will be found. And his friend said, I don't understand your calm in this situation. How can you possibly think anyone is going to find us? The man said, it's simple. I made $400,000 last year, and I tithe. Believe me, my pastor will find us. <laughs> there is your stewardship joke of the day. It really doesn't have anything to do with the story that we just read, although it does because it talks about looking for someone who is lost. We call this the prodigal son, and the word prodigal means extravagantly wasteful. And more and more scholars are beginning to call this the parable of the prodigal father because he's pretty lavish with his grace. Now this morning, I want you to think of stewardship. I do. I want you to think of stewardship every day of your life because we've been talking about call. Once you're called, you have to respond. And the way we respond is by the stewardship of all of life, by understanding that what we have is a gift from God. What we have is already God's. What we return to God is what we have received from God's benevolent and loving hand. But that is not just money, is it? We tend to think of things in terms of money and finance, but what we really need to think about is the stewardship of every aspect of our life. And I want you to think this morning about the stewardship of family and relationships. There was a Bible study that came out probably 15 or 20 years ago that was called Steward. One of the writers was Bruce Birch, who was a professor at Wesley Theological Seminary where Bill and I attended. Bruce is a learned and lovely man, and he wrote a, a passage about the stewardship of family and relationships. The group I was studying with happened to be all women. And I said, how would your family change if you started to think of your family and particularly your spouse as your gift from God. Well, one woman sort of laughed and she went home and she said, she told her husband, Pastor Terry said, you are God's gift to me. God help me. <laughs> <laughs> and she said that for a few weeks he went around, every time she got angry with him, which happened because he sort of deserved it, she would be reminded, I'm God's gift to you. I am God's gift to you. I am God's gift to you. But she said the amazing thing that happened was the more that he said it, the more he started to act like a gift. And when I do premarital counseling, I share with those couples who come to me whatever stage they are in life, and I tell them, the one thing that I know I did right in my marriage was to thank God for my husband every single day, especially the days when he didn't feel like such a gift or a gift that I would have gladly returned or exchanged <laughs> if given the option. But what would the world be like if we looked at this as a model for our families, I think the world would be a very different place. But we probably think that this father is a little bit foolish. And if you look at this story, and I ask you to pay close attention, when the young son comes to him and says, I want my share of your property now, what is he really saying to his father But I wish you were dead? I want my inheritance. And when he packs everything he owns, what does that imply? But that he has no intention of ever returning home. Now, if you're a young Jewish boy at the time this is written and you're taking your inheritance to a far off land, that means you're not just leaving your father behind. You're not just leaving your brother behind. You're not just leaving the farm behind. You're leaving behind your community of faith. You're leaving behind the temple. You're leaving behind your ability to practice your faith. And then what happens? But there is the time that comes when he has squandered all the inheritance, and he is destitute, and there's a famine. 
Now, if you really pay attention to the story and you know anything about Jewish culture and history, and if you know anything about the Mosaic Law, you know that for a young Jewish man to work in a pig field is a no-no. Not only could you not eat pork, you were not supposed to associate with pork when it was on all four feet. And here he is working in a pig farm. Have you ever lived near a pig farm? Have you ever driven by a pig farm? Nothing on earth smells like a pig farm. It is not the prettiest scent you could ever imagine by any stretch of the imagination. And so he is not only ritually unclean, he is filthy, dirty, and he is a complete mess. And when you're a Jewish kid in the first century and you find yourself jealous of pigs, you have really come to a low point in your life. And that's when it happens. He comes to himself. He remembers who he is. He remembers that he has a father whose servants eat more than the pigs, and yet he is here jealous of what they are eating. And so he decides he's going to go home. He's going to go home and he's going to share what he has learned with his father. He's going to say, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am not worthy to be called your child. Call me your servant. Let me live among your slaves and I will serve you. Now, do you remember what our call to worship was? That famous proverb. If anyone knows any passage from Proverbs, they know that line. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's the King James Version that I learned it in. But we know that sometimes that doesn't come true, does it? Sometimes our children, despite our best efforts, make choices that break our hearts and that are going to lead them into all sorts of problems. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm advocating just take whatever bad abuse you get from your family. That's not what this is about. But it is about holding our families as close to us as our own lives. And that is what the father does. Because when the son turns toward home, the father sees him from a distance because he's never stopped looking for him. He's never stopped standing at the door, just as the song the men sang this morning. See by the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. If you've ever had a teenager who was out at night with a car, you understand that feeling. And his father sees him, bedraggled, coming up the road, and runs to him. You need to understand another thing about the first century when men wore dresses. They did not run. It was a sin to show your ankles because if the priest walking up the steps to make sacrifice, ankles were shown, he had to go through a ritual purification. The father does not care. This is a man of means. This is a landowner. This is someone with a lot of gravitas in the community. This is someone who is revered. And yet when he sees his child coming toward him, he cannot help himself. He runs with his arms wide open, throws his arms around him, and embraces him, and welcomes him home. This is a model for families. And it's also a look into the psychology of families because we get the older brother, don't we? If we don't get the younger one, we get the older one. Because the older one is the one who has done everything that was ever expected or asked of him. He has done it without whining or complaining. He has done it in anticipation of his share of the inheritance as well, I'm sure. But because he's just a good guy and he's there with his father working every day. Now when his younger brother went away, we can imagine what he was thinking to himself. Well, there he goes, good for him, good riddance. And he hears a party and he will not come in because he does not approve of his father's grace and forgiveness. There's a lot to be learned about families in this passage, but there's even more to be learned about God because this is who God is for us in Jesus Christ. Now, I've taught many confirmation classes through the years, and we have some recently confirmed people here this morning, don't we? And I've taught classes for people who are new to faith, and I used to begin with Adam and Eve in the garden. You know that story, right? Adam and Eve in the garden and the snake and the apple and all that good stuff. 
One day when I looked at a room full of middle schoolers or into the faces of people who did not grow up in the church or in faith and realized that I was telling them a story about two naked people and a talking snake. <laughs> Think about that. If you don't know this story, you come into a church and you're looking for something and your heart is aching and they say, well, there were these two naked people and the snake walked up and said, eat this apple. They think you're nuts. <laughs> but if you say to them, there was a father who had two sons. One was a goody two-shoes who did everything right and the other was a complete and utter screw-up. They get it because this is who God is for us in Jesus Christ. This is who God is for us in Jesus Christ. The one who welcomes the one who went the wrong way and the one who forgives the one who went the right way on his own righteous self, righteous self. He won't come to the party. Why not? Because he doesn't understand that everything that belongs to the Father is from the Father and is the Father's to give or to withhold. He cannot understand a father who would give and give and give again. I understand the father because I've spent my life looking at this story and understanding that I am both the older son and the younger son. I'm not going to explain to you how I'm the younger son, partly because my parents are here and I don't want them to hear those stories. <laughs> You can be like the older brother who looked at his younger brother and said, he squandered your money with prostitutes. We don't know that. He just assumed that. So you can assume whatever you want about me and my reckless days. But I can be the older brother too. I can be jealous of someone else's grace. I can say, well, God, I gave my life to you. Can't you find me a house, Lord? Everybody else has a house, Lord. Why not me? But we're all invited to the dinner. We're all welcome at the table. And we are called to be stewards of that table and that party in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that when those who have gone the wrong way wander through our doors, we kill the fatted calf. We bring them the robe. We throw our arms around them and we welcome them in the name of their Savior because they have remembered who they are and they have come looking for the grace that God so freely provides. As one whom a mother comforts, so shall I comfort you. Those are the words of our Lord God to the prophet Isaiah at the time when the exile had ended and the people were coming home. God, the creator of all things, God, the king of all things, God, sovereign, omniscient, omnipresent, loves us as a mother tenderly drawing her child to her breast. That is who God is for us in Jesus Christ. That's what stewardship is about, remembering who we are, remembering whose we are, so that when we turn toward home, or whether we're at home and someone turns toward us, we understand that we are stewards of this grace. We are stewards of each other. We are stewards of our family relationships. I've seen this story play out too many times in the lives of the families I've served through the years. I have seen families destroyed over the death of a parent and who gets dad's pocket watch or mom's teapot. I've seen families destroyed because one cannot forgive the other for the mistakes they made. I've seen families destroyed because of stubborn self-righteousness. But if this is a model of who God wants us to be in Jesus Christ for each other, we can learn to love and forgive, not because it feels like it's time, but because we understand who God is and we understand what we have been forgiven. We understand God's love for us, and we can no longer withhold grace from each other.
Come home, Jesus says. Come home. You who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling sinner and saint alike. Come home. Amen.